Hello and welcome to our Irish Modernisms Roundtable podcast from the Centre for Contemporary Art, Derry, Londonderry. I'm Catherine Hamelreich, CCA's Director, and I'm very pleased to introduce artists James Ash, Rachel Campbell Palmer, Philip McCrilly, Grace McMurray, Ben Weir, and my co-curator, Matt Ritalik. Irish Modernisms is an exhibition of new and existing work by NI-based artists responding to modernism's influences and legacies in the North. The artists in the show work across different media and disciplines, but share a sensibility and arguably an affection for the often maligned movement. The show references the buildings and infrastructure around us, pattern, domestic design, literature, as well as questions of labor, gender and sexuality, materiality, decay, color, public and personal histories, progress in inverted commas, and quite a lot of concrete. James Ash is an artist and designer from Craigavon, a new town and home to the iconic modernist Marlborough House that features in one of the series of prints James created for the exhibition. James is an artist and activist with work currently on show at the Ulster Museum. Rachel Campbell Palmer lives and works in Belfast. She has exhibited across Ireland and is also director of Black Box in Belfast. Terra Firma in the show is a work seven years in the making, with cast concrete lozenge shapes arranged from the least weathered to most, showing the effects of nature and time on the material. Grace McMurray is based between Rathfriland and Belfast and is a member of the 2021 Turner Prize nominated Array Collective. Her works in the show include intricately woven ribbons referencing tiling patterns, interiors and domestic labour. Ben Weir is based in the Netherlands and NI. He's a research associate at CCA and has a practice encompassing visual art and architecture. He devised an abstracted hearth and kitchen counter for the show as a display device for Philip McCrilly's research materials. Philip was born in Moy and his interest in the controversy surrounding the first electrified shop sign in the village back in 1957 was the starting point for the work in the show. Philip is currently a participant on the Freelands Foundation programme and member of Fruit Shop Collective. Finally, my co-curator, Matt Ritalik. I first encountered Matt through his modernist.ie Instagram account that he set up after being told there was no modernism on the island of Ireland. He shares archive images of examples of the wealth of modernism on his account and is an honorary lifetime member of the Modernist Society and currently studying for an art history PhD at Manchester School of Art and associate curator of Pink Manchester. So that's who you'll be hearing from, so let's crack on. I'd like to start by asking each of you, when were you first aware of modernism? Perhaps we'll start with you, James. Yeah, so my first sorry, exposure to modernism, or what I sort of like first knew what it was, was maybe when I was studying my undergraduate degree at Norwich. I went to the art university there, but I learned more about the graphic design aspect of modernism. So I kind of learned about layouts like um, from Joseph Muller Brockman and also different art movements like constructivism and um, like Rod Rodchenko. There is an image of a woman holding like a microphone that's saying read. That's sort of the earliest I got, I learned about modernism and also like, you know, sort of like Swiss graphic design. And that aspect of graphic design is where I learned about modernism and then this sort of like throughout the years of studying, I started to learn more about like Bauhaus and different architecture styles. So like brutalism and Art Deco, those I kind of learned about. But when I look back, I've always been kind of surrounded by these modernist building designs. Like for example, I, I, I originally, my fa- me and my family from Belfast, but I was born in Belfast City Hospital, and that's been an iconic part of the skyline. That you know, that big fruitless grey and yellow tower that you people either love or hate. And then uh, part of my childhood, I grew up in Craig Avenue with the big Mar- Marlborough House with all the oval windows. Then when I uh, when I was living in England, I lived in Norwich, and like right on my doorstep, I had. What is called the the stationary office or Anglia Square, and it's just basically it's a big 
brutal, derelict office. Um, it's very iconic, concrete, lots of glass. Um, and then also University of East Anglia, it's a big concrete jungle, fruitless, modern. Um, I've always been kind of surrounded by modernist buildings for at different stages of my life. So that's kind of been my exposure to modernism. Rachel, I'd like to bring you in here because uh, you have your work massives uh, with the concrete blocks. And uh, did you have a similar experience? Were you surrounded by a similar environment to James? Yeah, and just as James was talking there, I was thinking my experience is quite similar in terms of, um, I guess, an introduction to modernism was through uh, a lot of the buildings um, in Belfast near where I grew up. Um, the terra firma piece that you mentioned, which is the other work I had in the show with uh, Massives, is based on Dunluce Health Centre car park, uh, very near to the um, city hospital building that, that James mentioned. And it's just, it's it's a, it's a actually a wall, a concrete um, wall that has a similar um, pattern formation to the piece. And for me, that just it really connects me with where I grew up and with Belfast um, and I suppose quite often I'm sort of drawing links between buildings and location and memory and and, and just sort of how they all connect so um, yeah I guess Dunley's Health Centre Park Park was probably my first introduction to modernism but, with, but like Jim says I mean I knew buildings and I really liked um, the shapes and the forms and the clean lines and um, also growing up very close to also museum which of course is just such an iconic um, building it really has that clash of, of modernism and classical architecture and um, but but like the buildings and the style before I probably realized what it was or what it was called and then you know from then learned sort of more about the history and the architecture. I know that Ulster Museum is uh, has been a reference point for Ben. Uh, you did one of our CCA takeovers earlier in the year, and it was an image that appeared there. So, what was your experience of Modernism Festival? Yeah, anytime I hear the Ulster Museum, my ears kind of perk up a little bit in reference to the building itself, perhaps rather than its content. Um, it's it's always a, a constant reference for me. Yeah, I don't know when I first heard of modernism but i know that the first time that i explicitly learned about it was in university but even then i guess when i when i heard the term it didn't seem like an alien concept to me so it was kind of floating around there in the subconscious somewhere maybe it was mentioned to me through literature more than uh, as a kind of artistic movement um but yeah then in, in university uh where i studied my bachelor's in architecture first of all at ulster um yeah i then became aware of people like the, the kind of founding fathers let's say of uh, of modernism like Walter Gropius, Le Corbusier, Misandro, etc. But what it actually is, what to me, um, or was, I think, is perhaps more appropriate because I think it's as much of a historical movement as something like, let's say, the, the Baroque movement or, or any kind of historical art movement. And it's in, a, in a sense, it's actually more than a movement because it's comprised of so many sub-movements, uh, some of which James has kind of alluded to. So perhaps it's more like an international project or like a school of thought. And I think it's it was something that was entirely future oriented. It was something about new technology, new materials, new forms of living, and the general tend away from traditional modes of representation and towards abstraction and therefore universality. But in the way that I look at it and work with it in my practice, I tend to look at it retrospectively and analytically. And in a sense, what we can kind of salvage from this kind of flawed project. Yeah, that's a really, really nice way to look at it, I think. And partly why we've called the show Irish Modernisms with that S is because there is that plurality. There is a, so many different interpretations and within all of you as well as uh, artists, there's not just one, this is its legacy. So yeah, we wanted to reflect that in the show. Picking up on uh, future and progress, uh, Philip, there's a really beautiful, one of the clippings in your research is about the motorway uh, that I really enjoyed looking at. So uh, what about for you? What what was it about uh, modernism? Um, well, I suppose my first experience of modernism, but not maybe being able to kind of tangibly say what it was my experience of like being is in modernism is I suppose similar to what Rachel and James have been talking about I remember growing up visiting my granny and just being really taken by how the chapel she went to was so different to the chapel I went to it was just a modernist chapel and I was just really interested in how it was so different to the one that I would go to 
in my local area and just how it made me feel and how everything was so exposed and I think like how the choir you could see the choir they weren't hidden away and there was no disembodied voice or anything and it was just so open and light I suppose that was my first experience of modernism and then I suppose as well where I grew up to in rural county Tyrone is kind of at the start of the M1 which was the first motorway in in Northern Ireland and I suppose it's the kind of the harbour and or brought everything together and stuff so yeah. Grace coming to you now. Um, I first became aware of modernism in school because we studied um, The Great Gatsby which definitely had elements of modernism and that kind of led me on to to find T.S. Eliot and that led me on to uh, Joyce and that kind of led me on to Mondrian and then Le Corbusier and I think I started then studying it at university, but with a postmodern approach. And to me, I kind of feel like modernism to me is about like streams of consciousness and how that informs work. I love the connection, connecting the dots there and one thing leading to the other to the other. I know that's um, something I, I chime with. And also I'm from the West Midlands in England. So um, we have so much brutalist, but it's such a mishmash patchwork. And um, I don't know, Matt, did you have a similar experience? Yeah, well, I grew up in Cornwall and um, Cornwall is not one of those places that you would think has abundant modernism. Um, but of course, there are things such as uh, St Ives modernism, um, the, the so-called St Ives school. Um, and this is what I grew up with. So as a child, I was seeing sculpture, you know, out in the wild regularly um, by artists such as Barbara Hepworth or paintings by Ben Nicholson, but not realising that these were modernists because they were just they were just around us. Um, and I think, you know, a uh, a lot of what's been said today, the experience is that you you go into higher education and you and you learn what modernism is. But the modernism that you're taught is, of course, sort of caught in the grand gesture of, you know, big buildings, big names, um, literature, James Joyce, for example. And I suppose that really my adult life so far has been spent trying to understand what modernism is and understand where the slippages are. And you, you realise that it's, it's a lot messier and more complex than, than you think. I think that's definitely something we can all agree on. <laughs> so coming to look at um, more of the works in the show, there are some threads that uh, pull between various works. One of them is the use of colour. So I wonder, Grace, I'd love to know more about how you decide about the colour palettes you use, what leads into them. I think I try to make work that's quite, I, well, I use textiles, so I want the work to be tactile and I use a lot of blues within the work because I find that quite soothing. And I try to create environments where I control everything. And I think that's in parallel to how I feel generally. I, I, I want to, through my work, like process a lot of emotions and I guess I associate like emotions with blues and I think the colour palette of the show with the pinks and the blues and the, the yellows, it's all kind of interrelated and I use colour patterns that have different gradients to kind of draw you in and to mess with your vision um, and I even like the aspect of using say glitter ribbon and how that affects how you view something. I want something to be like always gluttonous and how it attracts your attention. There's some beautiful pinks that run through as well that sort of are really accented by the way that the other blues palettes are coming through so it, it, it it's a very conscious decision that you're making there so are they reference points or um, how, how does that come about for you? I am a beekeeper and so I realised that honeybees see colour in terms of UV, so they can see flight paths on petals, so that like guides them. So I've always tried to create environments that are soothing and I have control over them, and so I guess it's that kind of connection. Even when Plath um, writes about images of honeybees in the hive, and so it's connected to that as well. So yeah, it's kind of to do with the colour spectrum. I think there's so many nice uh, 
connecting principles between your work and Rachel's work as well. Uh, Rachel, you have these in in the the massives you have the sort of fleshy pink resin sections mm -hmm. and also thinking about the hive with these the concrete forms could you tell us a little bit more about these totally i mean i was thinking just when grace was talking there some of the things she was talking about you could definitely have parallels with and when i'm yeah thinking about color in my work materials are such a key part of the work i make and the process of creating work and that is often what inspires me a lot of the time and i i use quite industrial materials concrete plastic or resin wood but I, I don't I generally don't pigment the materials like I like to work with them because of the color that they are in their sort of natural state so the resin that you're referring to it's a polyester casting resin and it cures that pink color essentially it's a, it's a cheap resin and uh, I just when I, I you know was exploring different types of resin I came across this resin and I just love that it cured this like really fleshy pink color and for me it brought in lots of different references to the work especially in amongst the concrete so it looks it looks fleshy it looks like uh, crystallized forms it looks like sweets like Turkish delight or something I like the different conceptual kind of ideas that it then brought to the work especially in contrast with the concrete and also playing on that idea of surfaces and what materials are like there's maybe it, it might look kind of um, squishy or soft but actually it's very hard like I like sort of playing with the, the different states um, of materials as well and yeah and seeing dialogue that's created between them and then when Grace is talking there about bees the, the terra firma piece this is, this is the other work in the show you know it looks like this sort of honeycomb pattern and uh, something else that Grace achieves in her work that I think is relevant to my practice as well is this like optical illusion the three-dimensional effect so in Grace's weaving she creates real depth and three-dimensional qualities to her surfaces and that's something I really played with in that terra firma piece which has positive and negative space and depend on how you view it and how the light views it parts look solid that are maybe actually our gap and, and vice versa so yeah that really sort of resonates with me as well but just also thinking about color i use a lot of concrete in my work but concrete itself has many tones and hues to it that I get very excited about. So depending on what state it's at through its curing process, it changes color really significantly from, from dark sort of greeny, gray, sort of murky kind of algae color when it's fresh out of the cast. And then it, it gradually just lightens and lightens. And depending on the mix of product that you use, sometimes you get quite pinky hues, sometimes you get blue tones. Um, it, it really varies. And, and I love that it continues to change over a period of time. So even the work in the exhibition during the course of the exhibition will, will subtly change during that, that lifetime. So when I go back and look at it again, I know that it'll be at a, a further along the drying process and starts and kind of much lighter and chalkier and then with the, the terra firma piece I mean that shows how the environment and then how you know the impact of weathering on concrete and how that then changes surface again so how those external factors can change and, and in that piece there's a huge range of color that's being formed naturally so you've got greens and yellows from like moss and then you've got almost really kind of coppery rusted stones you know from the pieces that were like most exposed to the elements so in a material that people think of well, concrete's very grey actually there's lots of nuances of different colours and I, I really love that it really excites me about the material I have a question off the back of that. I mean, obviously, you could say that there's been this renewed interest in concrete, and you, you only have to look at social media platforms such as Instagram to see that there are many accounts that just look at concrete buildings or look at concrete as a material. And obviously, there is a very obvious strand of concrete through the exhibition. And although you've partially answered this already, Rachel, I'm really interested in what the appeal is for you as artists who are working with concrete. So for example, Ben, how did you come to your piece? It's interesting then the, the kind of the discussion of, around the resurgence in the use of concrete when speaking as someone from an architectural background, it's something that I really think we should be moving away from in contemporary building practice. It's, you know, a, a material that releases huge amounts of carbon and it has a huge amount of embodied carbon uh, because of that, mostly in the production of cement, uh, mostly like the aggregate comes from recycled sources like uh, ground down demolition or sources that are much more sustainable. But yeah, the production of cement is something that we should really be aiming to move on from. But then there's this reflective thing that we 
that we also need to do and kind of reassess what we already have and what exists. And I mean, there's many concrete buildings right now that are that were kind of built in mid-century. They're being torn down, uh, which is extremely problematic because they have such a high level of embodied carbon, but also because they were built on almost like a Corbusian principle of a concrete frame with concrete floor slabs and in theory can be adapted into potentially anything. You know, you can turn a grid of columns into anything. That's the whole purpose is that it is a universal thing. So I'm very much kind of in favor of of the reuse of concrete, uh, reflecting upon it in a way that doesn't somehow stimulate new uses for it. And there are alternatives that are coming out now, not so much in the island of Ireland yet, but CLT, for example, and Grand Earth. The, the seeds are getting sown in these kind of new materials that might pave the way in some way to kind of reducing concrete as, a, as the predominant building material. But maybe that's a bit of a side note, but I, I kind of always feel that I should mention that. But I, yeah, I find myself always trying to not use it, but then getting sucked into using it. <laughs> Because it's difficult to talk about modernism without, you know, mentioning that material or mentioning steel or plate glass. But I guess my work tries to form an inherent critique of the use of concrete in that actually the the work which is made in, in concrete blocks is going to be disassembled at the end of the show. And I aim for it to be sold on and, and reused and become swallowed into somebody's garden shed or somebody's front wall or a partition that they're building a house for a new WC or whatever. And that, that you know, to me is as much part of the work as, as the installation in the gallery itself. And, and this is something that's common throughout history in the kind of pre-modernist era. I mean, modernism tended to think that it was like a solution and that it could solve things and what it was building was the solution. And it never imagined that it could become something else. But in kind of 19th century and earlier buildings that are made entirely in stone were constantly being recycled. If you look at large cathedrals in the center of the town, whenever it was taken down, was used to build adjacent workers' housing. Infrastructure was taken apart, reused. Uh, and it's all just made in, in cut stone and it can all just be cut into smaller pieces or dragged somewhere else. There's there's even a term called spolia, which refers to that, you know, the reuse of uh, these kind of fragments. There's this quote, what is it? The past is like a junkyard of ruins. And I think that's really interesting that my work will almost have like a second life as something a bit more modest but we need to yeah sometimes use concrete as a, as a kind of means to an end or as, a, or as a talking point or whatever i mean obviously the amount of concrete that's used in the show doesn't equate to the not a, it's a drop in the ocean compared to the amount of concrete that's getting thrown up around the city but yeah that's complex <laughs> So actually, I've got a brief question for you off the back of that about go, going back to social media again and the abundance of accounts that are posting sort of mid-century concrete buildings. Do you think that is a healthy activity? Do you think it is a way to show people what we've got? Buildings that would otherwise, without interest, be pulled down, just thinking of embodied carbon, um, et cetera? Absolutely, yeah. I think it's important that we all learn from our existing built history and that people should understand why things look the way they do. Yeah, in the same way that people look at the Jackson Pollock painting and they think, oh, you know, my two-year-old could do that. People also look at a lot of mid-20th century buildings and they say, look at this big boxy thing. Isn't it such a beast? This is gargantuan behemoth and it's got no humanity in it. When actually, if you start kind of reassessing things or looking perhaps with closer eyeglass, you see that there's something there, something really important. And maybe when you do that, you start to realize something about the intention behind the work and maybe the dissociation that happens between intent and how it manifests itself in the world, or also just about socio-political and economic forces that made the thing the way it is in the world today. And perhaps it only looks as bad as it does because you have these associations, or perhaps it looks as bad as that because the intent wasn't fully realized, and then maybe there's a problem with something like attitudes towards building practices. Like a lot of buildings in Glasgow, for example, high-rises were taken down because they were unsafe, because they weren't built to the drawings. You know, they were finding out when they were disassembling some of these housing estates that actually the precast panels weren't tied together and they were just hanging there in, in the air for 20, 30 years before they were taken down. And then sometimes, I guess, with modernist housing estates, this beautiful universal kind of shared space, you know, the car-free zones, which ended up being really badly managed and began to breed crime, were actually faults perhaps more of how to manage the space rather than the design or the aesthetic of the space itself. So I think the more that we look back at these things and talk about them, the more you learn, the more useful it is. Discourse should be shared. And it's good that discourse happens on social media because it's then, to some extent, democratised and you're not talked down to. I'd really like to ask James about uh, your prints because 
Matt and I invited you after seeing the other prints you'd done uh, that was sort of these love letters to these brutalist modernist buildings around Belfast that and particularly those that are either not huge not widely appreciated or they have that sort of love-hate relationship with the place or that they're at risk of crumbling because they've not been looked after so how did you go about selecting the buildings and what is it about them that drew you to drawing them? So I started drawing them about 2017. I started drawing them. Um, at that time, there were a lot of plans going about for buildings in Belfast to be demolished, turned into like high rise hotels, apartments, offices. But it's a lot of sort of like buildings that are actually they're privately owned by a third party or a private property development. Now, some of them are like listed heritage buildings. I mean, in the past, we've had mysterious fires, damaged buildings or like buildings just left open to the elements and like just withered and deteriorated away if, particularly if you walk along North Street that part of Belfast that whole street is near enough all that day and just all like empty buildings but I mean there's some great iconic ones I've drawn like a lot of people would affiliate me with the transport house drawing that's it's actually still owned by Unite the Union but you know it's got that great tiled front with you know the workforce standing it together as one against the sort of corruptions of bosses and capitalism and then you know not far away you've got the north street arcade which you know it's been a husk as long as i can remember and then up the street from that you've got the bank of ireland which you know it drew influence from the chrysler building in new york you can kind of see that influence in it. Again, that's another building. It's been sitting empty for God knows how long. But I think the last time I checked, a few years ago or something like that, it's planned to get turned into a hotel. And then obviously I've already drawn the likes of Belfast City Hospital and a few other ones as well. My practice is kind of interesting because it, it touches upon what Ben was saying about these buildings that have been torn down or weren't drawn to plan. Where I'm from, Craig Adams, quite interesting because... It was originally planned to be a new city outside Belfast. Like people were getting paid to move out of Belfast to go live in Craig Avon. I mean, it still very much is a commuter hub for people going to Belfast for work or even going as far as Dublin because it's kind of one of the first big spots you get to in North Armagh. Once you cross the border past Newry, you go to Craig Avon. But if you go to Craig Avon, there's a lot of roads that go to nowhere or just like a lot of empty the areas and the states. That's mainly because they ran out of money and the trouble started during the 70s when they were doing the development for the new city of Craigavon. But yeah, that's kind of been about my practice and sort of background. With use of colour, I'm kind of known for like using a lot of like bright oranges and you know these very vibrant colours, but in the additions I've done for Irish modernisms, actually drew influence from Sainsbury's own label designs. Um, Matt would know what I'm talking about, but it's, by, it's a book, it's a collection of designs from Sainsbury's own design team. One of the designers, I think his name is Peter Dixon. But when you look at the designs, it's all these yellow, oranges, whites, and greys that are pretty similar to what I've used in my prints. But the designs are very modernist. Even, even on some of the labels, they tend to use the same colored dots like orange that just kind of reminds me of the oval windows i have over in marlborough house in craig Alvin. that's kind of where i drew my influence from for the colors i think marlborough house is just the first time i saw it it was like it's from outer space it's such a fine example of the building from its era i think yeah, it's you know it's silver look too because like a lot of people you know people I spoke to before that they aren't really engaged with art or architecture right that kind of thing you know people just think it's ugly and just want it torn down and like you know right across from Marble Borough House you've got a big shopping centre which is like a warehouse and I'm like really you want to tear down something that looks like out of a Kubrick movie for some identical warehouse. Yeah, we've found the work being in the show. We've had so many people from Craig Avon making a beeline for it because it is just this piece that um, 
really has has shaped i think perhaps a, a perception of the city as well yeah i've definitely had a lot of people message me and ask me about the great on print i mean it's something people have been asking me to do for a long time but at the time i was working on i couldn't obviously really talk about it and so on so there's been a lot of anticipation for it i think it's very interesting that buildings such as marlborough house really polarize people and that is that is the case for many modernist buildings but it's interesting you you just saying there james that you've had a lot of messages that i have too and people are saying to be honest this is what people are saying this is not my opinion to be honest i think it's quite an ugly building but it's our ugly building and and i want to own a piece of it so it's that that need to hang on to it still even if you do think it's an ugly building which i find quite fascinating yeah it's such a key part of history and there's so many parts in the world where sort of ide- different ideologies come through and it's through the architecture and sort of yeah do you raise everything to the ground and start fresh all the time or do you keep these elements i think we need ugly buildings in our areas because like do you really want every town and every high street to have the same shops the same factories the same like dedicated offices and so on i mean you need character i totally agree with you james and growing up in cornwall um in truro which is the only city in cornwall there used to be uh well there still is uh this this multi-story car park and as a kid i used to say to my mum i i really like that building and she used to go what are you going on about it is an ugly concrete building you know the, the phrase that we hear so often but you've got to understand that in cornwall that was a very alien presence and it really really stood out and it felt uh exciting in a way there's a very similar sort of car park i think it's been demolished recently but in oxford street just off oxford street in london it's got these sort of diamond shaped facade windows yeah it would be sort of similar feeling of what you're talking about is it called welbeck that's that's the one welbeck street yeah philip i'd like to invite you to talk to us about the scandal of the Hobsons of Moy street sign because I just absolutely love this story I hadn't encountered it before I'm sure I suppose my whole like process of making with the exhibition as well was grappling with the kind of question of well why does my work in any way represent modernism or what do I speak to that legacy so it involved a lot of like research which my work mostly does take the form and resist any kind of physical form at the end but in my research I kind of was drawn to my the local area where I grew up and came across the story of a local store that wanted to have a sign for the shop and yes it was the scandal of the time because there was nothing else to be worried about it wasn't accepted by the local people and it was seen as garish and unsightly and I suppose one of the, the first things I thought was well it would be nice to maybe make a sign for this space because you know it didn't have it but I thought that might be too easy of a kind of solution to that problem or that history so I wanted to relate it more to some other research I was doing around queer social spaces and sort of spaces that facilitated the coming together of different groups of people and the support of other people. There was a particular club in Belfast in the 80s called the Carpenter Club uh, that was named after Edward Carpenter. And it was a queer social space that had a cafe that also shared its space with the local anarchist society. And I liked that coming together, these two disparate groups of people that weren't in any way sort of on the fringe of society and not being supported elsewhere and holding each other up, I guess. So I wanted to create a sign for that space, a kind of fictional sign for this space. And I think actually in the course of the show, some people have come in to the exhibition, as you all know, Catherine, and kind of been, oh, that's that space that we used to go to. That's been a really nice outcome of the work as well. And kind of in a broader sense, the whole project in the show has kind of looked at the tentative adaption of electricity within rural Ireland and the resistance of that and the legacy of that. There is a number of elements within the, in the exhibition and I kind of see them as all sort of supporting parts to a greater whole. So there's a wall painting in the show, sorry, that refers to the practice of blessing ceremonies that would have happened in rural Ireland with the turning on of electricity. And there's a definite play. I know there's been a conversation about colour. I suppose there's been a definite decision in my work about light and darkness and sort of that turning on of electricity and remaining in the dark. But the wall drawn in itself refers to the signature of a saint that's the patron saint of uh, electricity and electrical engineers. Yeah, I found I, I was learning so much through your work. I, was, I, I never knew there was a patron saint of electricity. That's 
just uh, there's a patron tip for everything <laughs> <laughs> but also I think I'll, I'll probably put a link up with this there was a fascinating podcast from the Irish passport about the electrification of the island of Ireland and just how involved and how political that was that I think people from outside the island just don't know about there was some actually some interesting conversations that we were having before about like electricity is this really political thing too so like in Ireland the kind of the whole country being um, hooked up together and stuff and this almost being this solidarity between North and South and kind of coming, I think it was the primary ownership of Terence O'Neill and his want to kind of like connect all of Ireland in electricity and then it's been seen by a certain part of the community as this kind of step too far and one of the ways to kind of undermine his ministership was to turn um, hijack electricity warehouses and the and to turn off electricity and kind of hold that hostage kind of so I thought that was quite a nice gesture I think another really interesting uh, strand um, off the back of Philip's work actually in the exhibition is this idea of the domestic and modernism in the domestic realm. And I think, you know, that that happens in Philip's work hosted by Ben's sculpture and installation, but it also happens in Grace's work. And I was wondering if I could ask Grace, where does the domestic come into play in your work? I think I've always been interested in the Bauhaus movement and that kind of idea of form and function and these objects that are symbols of intense labour. And within the show, there's definitely references between like the fireplace and then the floor and then this fabric wall and this headboard. I guess it's a lot of structures that we bring associations to. So that's what I'm interested in because I think as somebody that grew up in a working class environment in a rural community, I was taught all of these skills and I feel like, particularly with gendered labour, there's this idea that as a woman you have to create free labour for the benefit of others and to almost like be a vessel and be seen and not heard and I think because the materials I use are so extravagant, it kind of has a voice, even though it appears to be silent. And so I like that idea of, you know, being taught to be seen but not heard, but still communicating your voice in a way through what you make. And so, yeah, I really like the connections between everything and the associations yeah, creating this kind of internal space that I guess we know a bit more about that even now through living through a pandemic in terms of, you know, gathering around these domestic objects and feeling safe within that. So yeah, I create work that is essentially geometric and digital, but is handmade and you can see the edges and the back of it and you can see all the imperfections because I think I try to make everything perfect because that's where I feel most comfortable with that surrounding me but in a way I prefer the imperfections. That's definitely something that has come through seeing how our visitors have been responding to your work that those imperfections and the fact that it is handmade are visible when when you're looking at it but when it is through the screen it does seem almost artificially pristine pristine in human perfect and it's something that particularly on your work that is the screen where it's exposing the back it's skewed because of the tensions of the ribbons that are being pulled and that's very intentional to show that it's not that it's a mistake it's that we can see that physical the physicality of the labor there I think it's um, really nice to hear from so many of you as well uh, that conversation and just to finish this recording Matt, it's been so nice to work with you as a co-curator and to work with all of you uh, as, as our artists as well. So we've had so many great conversations with you and it's been really positive and reciprocal experience uh, from my perspective. Yeah, f- thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it, it's an absolute pleasure to be invited to co-curate uh, with you. And lovely to work on a project that was fun to work on and really opened my eyes to the possibilities of modernism And this is where we pause our conversation. You can listen to the second part of this roundtable on Spotify, iTunes, Anchor, Google and other podcast providers. Irish Modernisms is open until the 18th of September 2021 at CCA Derry London Derry. And for those of you unable to visit, you can see images at our website ccadld.org and across our socials at ccadld.org.
This roundtable is made possible thanks to the support of Arts Council of Northern Ireland, Derry City and Strabane District Council, the Art Fund, British Art Network, the Paul Mellon Centre, Yale, Arts Council England and Tate. And thanks to Jessica Dukes, Martin Myrone, Danielle Goulet, Mel Bradley, Laura McCafferty and Fiona Allen. Thank you for listening.